two, you know, cameras on so that you know students away can see my board. Uh, but I will be focusing on my tablet. I, most of my writing will be on tablet, so you are able to see. I will share my screen with you here, so you'll be able to see my screen here. But sometimes I may need to write on the board, so that's why I turn to these cameras. Welcome. Yeah, very glad to see you all. Uh, looks like we are ready to go. So starting from. First of all, if you go to the Canva site, you will be able to see my page with, here is a concept, this is a big picture of dynamics, and also I, I put some formula, it, it is my own, so if you are interested in or see more detailed formulas, there is a one provided by FE Handbook, but this is my own formula, so feel free to use both of them, and then I'm going to go over the concept, um, you know, you know, throughout the dynamics class, also I will solve some of these examples together. So you are free to, you know, solve rest of the problems we could not, you know, cover in the class. I will send or upload those example answers maybe after the lecture, so that you can solve them and compare the, you know, answers with the examples. Also, um, I have put a quiz with I think twelve problems. So you are able to access this one until Monday, and then I will send uh, the upload the quiz answers. I think that will be available by next Tuesday. So you can practice quiz problems on your own. So there are multiple ways you can practice dynamics and vibrations. Okay, so let's go to the concept. You guys, are, are you able to see me okay and then hear me fine? The Zoom? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. And also, are you able to see the you know dynamics concept the notes? This is good? Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, basically, if you take a look at the concept, the dynamics, if you take a, if you remember from your um, you know, dynamics class, there are two major areas in dynamics. Number one is called particles. So the chapter 11, 12, 13, these are all about particles. You'll be able to see that particle, particle, particle. All right. And then there are three different, um, you know, the topics, major topics are kinematics. And also here is a kinetics. Oh, maybe they not be able to see me. Best way, because that's why I don't like you know having hybrid you know both. I'll, I'll focus on my heavily. So if you feel uncomfortable, you know please you know um, forgive me. So if you look at here, there are particle, 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 and then you will be able to see different topic. Here's a kinematics, kinetics, and then called energy and momentum. But this is also kinetics. If you remember what is Kinematics and what is kinetics? Uh, do you remember that? Kinematics is about understanding and studying the motion of your particles without considering the cause of the motion, which is the force or forces. So, you know, in chapter 11, you only cover where your particle is located, how fast is a particle is moving, and the, what is the acceleration, that's it. So you don't need to find you know, the forces in chapter 11. All of them are associated with motion. But if you are considering the motion associated with the cause, which means the force, it is called kinetics. So you must be able to understand what is kinematics versus what is kinetics. Again, kinetics only we consider the motion, but the kinetics we are considering motion and then how that is associated with forces. Making sense? And then, then the third one, the third chapter is kinetics again, but in chapter 12, you are using Newton's second law to find out how they are related to the forces and then what is the acceleration of the particle. But the chapter 13 is also studying kinetics by using two different approaches. One is called work and energy here, the, the, and 
the second one is called impulse and momentum. Do you remember those? Some, some noting, yeah. So I, I'm gonna write this here. So if you are interested in finding Newton's second law, that is going to be summing of your all the forces applied to your particle will be proportional to the rate of change of what? Linear momentum. Do you remember this? So it is ma if you know mass is constant, but if m, m, you know mass is not constant, you have to use the original form, the momentum. The rate of change of momentum is going to be same as that force applied to your particle. This is a vector equation, so you have to apply this one to you know different direction. If you are using x and y and then you have to apply scalar equation for x direction, and also you apply this one to the y direction. If you are using tangential and normal, you have to use this one individually, right? So that's why it is called the vector equation. In chapter 13, you will solve this one using two different equations. Number one, work and energy is initial So work and energy means if you have initial kinetic energy here, and then you are applying some work from between one and two, that is going to be same as final kinetic energy, all right? And also you have another equation is called one to two is going to be same as V1 minus V2. Here, T1, T2 is our kinetic energy, and then V1, V2 is our potential energies. Making sense? So in and then um, the impulse and momentum equation is going to be initial momentum, linear momentum, and B plus impulse. In this case here, the impulse is going to be same as you know final linear momentum. So what is impulse? The definition of impulse that is simply integration of force over time. So here three equation. One is Newton's second law in chapter 12, and then you will be using two equations in chapter 13 for the work and energy, and then final equation is called impulse and momentum. So far so good? So now what you can um, distinguish this one from here is, this is a vector equation. Also, this is a vector equation as well. You see vector notation here and here, but the Work and energy method, the equation is a scalar equation. You don't need to worry about directions. You only need to worry about the magnitude of velocity and then the, the work. Work is a scalar quantity. It is not, it is not a vector. So you only have the magnitude, total work. So for so good? So this is about the half of your dynamics. And then second half will be exactly repeated for rigid bodies. If you take a look at here, this is a rigid body, rigid body, rigid body, rigid body, kinematics, kinetics, also energy and momentum, work and energy, impulse and momentum. All the same. So if you understand, you know, work and energy, impulse and momentum from particles will be exactly applied to uh, the rigid body problems. So far so good? So what, what is the biggest difference between particle versus rigid body? What is particle and what is rigid body? You know the area that you have to worry about? No, no. Area doesn't matter. You know the shape doesn't matter. Rotation. Rotation, yes. So if you have a particle, even though it is huge, but all the forces are applied at one point, and then those forces will never make any rotational motion for the particle. Then, regardless of the shape, you know, it looks like a bunny shape. Right? Or it is simply you know the rectangle or you know circular shape, don't doesn't matter. So we have to only consider the forces applied to your body, and then all the forces apply to the same point, and then there is no rotation motion. Then we can consider this one as a particle. Even though this is a very small, tiny, you know, particle looks like this, but the forces are one is here, one is here. What happens? That is going to rotate this way. Making sense? then this is a rigid body. So again, no shape, no sizes, you know, important for distinguishing particles from rigid bodies.
So far so good? Okay. So if you see the big picture up to here, this is good. So this is a whole thing about dynamics. I finished it. Done. Go home. <laughs> All right. So here, the second topic we are going to cover today is called uh, vibration. We do not cover vibration as a required course in this program, but still we teach briefly this topic in multiple locations, multiple courses. So I will summarize only the basic and important things in this course at the end of the lecture. So if you've done you know, the general concept, we can go to formulas. So starting from particle kinematics. We are going to go over the exactly same order I, I, I did in the previous you know, slide. You know, started from particle kinematics, particle kinetics with um, the Newton Spectrometer, particle kinetics with you know, energy and momentum method, and then moving to rigid body kinematics, kinetics, kinetics, okay? So a couple formulas you have to be, you know, uh, you have to remember uh, because there's no notes or it is not working. I'm going to write on the board. Uh, maybe it's, no, this is not good. I'm going to write on the board. Hopefully you can. So, um, kinematics, and also this is about particles. If you have, you know, your system with a constant acceleration, do you remember three, you know, the, the quick formulas you have to remember? Constant acceleration means A is a constant, right? What is the velocity? I think you have to remember this one for kinematics from rectilinear motion. Constant acceleration. That was V0 plus acceleration of time, and then your position is going to be Initial position plus initial velocity times t plus half of a t squared, right? So this is it first. And then where do we use this constant acceleration? If you are handling a problem on gravitational force applied to a particle, this is a constant acceleration because gravity, the gravitational acceleration is always downward. Another good example you can find is about projectile motion. Do you remember that? It is a curvilinear motion, looks like this, but it is subject to two rectilinear motions. In the vertical direction, what is the motion? There is a gravity all the time, so this is called uniformly accelerated motion. You are able to apply these formulas for the y direction motion. And then if in the x direction, what happens? There is no acceleration in the x direction. What is a projectile? It is projected or dropped with the initial velocity, and then nothing, no more forces are applied to the particle. So in the x direction, there is no force. That means it is called uniform motion. Means, what does it mean? Velocity is a constant. Y direction, acceleration is a constant. So far so good? So we'll solve some examples about projectile motion later, but this is one good example of how we are handling a linear motion using you know, these formulas we cover. We are going to cover these in the curvilinear motion as well. So far so good? So this is about rectilinear motion. And then next we cover for the curvilinear motion. In the rectilinear motion using X and Y is a, probably the best way, you know, Cartesian coordinate. But if your particle moves along a curved path, you remember what coordinate system we use? Radial and transverse and normal and tangent, right? So 
if a particle is moving along a curved path like this, and then what is the direction of your velocity? Velocity is always in the tangential direction. There is no normal component. But if you are handling accelerations, acceleration has two components. One is one is tangential acceleration, and then you have normal acceleration. So is it good? So you need to set your coordinate system. How? This direction is e to t means like unifactor in tangential direction. And then this is e sub n, you know, unifactor in the normal direction. So again, your velocity is always in the tangential direction only. So now we are able to rewrite you know, acceleration vector using the magnitude and then the unit vector in the tangential direction. And then there is no component in the normal direction. But if you are handling an acceleration, acceleration, you have two components. One is tangential component, and then the other is normal component. And the tangential component is proportional to the rate of change of your velocity, dv dt, and then normal component is simply a function of linear velocity at the time over the geometry, the rate of a change, you know, the rate of coverage, the radius coverage, sorry. Everybody okay so far? So now, are you able to see this from the camera okay um, online? Better or not? Maybe I can change use. Oh, you're just yeah, that one's good. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. So you have, you know, tangential and normal component. If you are handling a particle rotating about a fixed point, that means your particle is one more curvilinear motion. Let's say your particle is. Uh, you know, defined by the radial distance, you know, using a radial direction vector about the rotating point, and also the angle of your rotation. This is called polar coordinate. So if you are given theta and r, then you better use. This is normal and tangent, but this is called radial and transverse, okay? So in this case, you will have two coordinates. One is in the radial direction. I'm gonna write this one E sub R, and then transverse direction, unit vector is E sub theta. They are not same, normal and tangent, radial transverse. Sometimes they are coinciding, but many of the cases, they are not. So in this case, the normal you know, unit vector is always toward the center of your curvature. Here's a curvature center. But this is always away from your rotation center. And then this is simply 90 degree rotation in the counterclockwise. They are defined differently. So now in this case, you need to write down your Velocity first. Velocity, unfortunately, has two components. One is which direction? Radial direction plus transverse direction. So radial direction, do you know how we can find it? Well, you have to remember these because the formula sheets are not allowed. This is going to be simply L dot. And then transverse direction, magnitude of velocity is L beta dot. Right? Everybody remember this? So this is how you know the particle is moving radially. You know, the rate of change of the velocity component in the transverse at this point versus at this point will be different because 
they, this point has a bigger R than this point. Even they are subject to same omega, what that are that, same rotational velocity, this point will have more transverse direction component than uh, this point has more than this because R is bigger for this point. So far so good? And then what is the acceleration? Unfortunately, this is more complex than velocity. Again, your acceleration has two components, E R and then E theta. Both have two components each. So how do we remember this? This is about acceleration. So radial component is associated with R double dot first. And then theta double dot. It is not a simply, you know, function of theta double dot, it is also a function of the location. Now, second point is negative r theta dot squared. This is a function of position and then rotational velocity squared. And then second part in the transverse is plus two r dot theta dot, means multiplication of two velocities. So how do we remember this? This is in the normal direction. See, r is a positive number, theta dot squared is a positive number, this is negative, means it is opposite direction of your radial direction. This is always this, this is toward the center. So this component is always toward the center. This component is called uh, Coriolis acceleration. I think you heard this term from your physics class. So you'll be able to see that, you know, this is a velocity for radial and transverse. This is acceleration for radial and transverse. Good. So now one thing is for the radial and normal and tangent, velocity has only one component, but acceleration has two components, transverse and radial, you know, tangential and normal. But for the radial and transverse coordinate system, both velocity and acceleration have two components, radial and transverse, radial and transverse. You have to remember these all formulas. Yes. Just to make sure I remember, remember this right. The normal tangent case is you're looking at the particle relative to its path of travel, right? and radial transverse is relative to the okay. origin. Okay. So, right. assuming your particle is moving along this path, so here's a particle, and then where is the, your tangential component? It is always tangent to the path. This is a tangential. Your unit vector, and then where is the normal component? This is toward the center, center of your curvature. Okay. But if you are considering this one from a fixed point, and using a radial and then transverse component, you have to connect this one using a vector, which is R, the position of your particle. So where is your radial ER? This is ER. And then this is going to be 90 degree E theta. So with the same given particle along the same you know, curvular path, depending on how you are setting up your coordinate system, you will have totally different your unit vectors. Good? Okay, I think, uh, what else I missed? One thing I missed here is, you are able to relate your velocity to your position, like velocity squared minus velocity initial squared is going to be two times a s minus s naught. Do you remember this? I yes. think it is. It doesn't have any, you know, t exclusively in this equation, but you are able to relate your velocity, you know, square difference to your position difference. These are four formulas for constant acceleration. Professor Good? Now, why we are using you know, these coordinates is we use this one in kinetics in chapter 12 as well. For example, do you remember the fourth, you know, Newton's second law? F equals M A, right? But if we are using normal and tangent coordinate system, then what happens? You are going to have two separate scalar equations. It's going to be like this all the forces in the tangential direction, right? That is same as m a t. So this is a vector equation, but this is a scalar equation, right? So you have to have two equations. One is 
tangential direction f equals ma, but second thing is normal direction f equals an. So how do you find this tangential direction acceleration? Here you want it. All right. So here a t is going to be simply dv dt. And then what about acceleration in the normal direction? Here it is. Making sense? If we are using the same uh, approach for the uh, you know tangential you know no radial and transverse, this is going to be your radial direction acceleration. This is transverse direction acceleration. So you have to break your vector equation into your component, either making you know, tangential and normal or radial and transverse. Good. And then uh, a couple more concepts. Do you remember this? H is called angular momentum. What is L? This is a linear momentum. Linear momentum is simply m times v. So this is a vector. This is a mass. But what is the angular momentum? Anybody remembers this? This is called moment of linear momentum. So like L cross mv. So this is a position vector, and then this is you know linear momentum. So if you are using cross product, and then if you are cross producting your you know position vector to your linear momentum, it is called angular momentum. Good. So where do we use angular momentum? For example, if you have your particle or maybe satellite rotating about Earth. Right? And then what is the force applied to this particle? The only gravitational force pulling this uh, satellite toward the center of Earth, right? And then if you have only, you know, center, you know, center, you know, uh, orienting force applied to your particle for the, you know, the curvilinear motion, it is called, you can call conservation of linear moment, uh, angular momentum. I cannot explain all the details in your background detail forever. You know, it is one quarter long lecture, but I'm going to give you only the basics. So again, if you have only particle with you know central direction force applied to your particle, you can apply called conservation of angular momentum. What does this mean? Is your angular momentum is conserved. That means what is the magnitude? You know, if you are applying the cross product, what is the magnitude of h? That is going to be L and V sine angle. So the angle here is angle between your know, position vector and your velocity. So conserved means this is constant. So it is you know random position angular momentum. This is any other position, you know, linear momentum, you know, angular momentum. So they are all same. So regardless of your position, let's say your particle is here, 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 your angular momentum, the magnitude of this one is always same. That's why if your particle is here, you know, your satellite is you know, close to your uh, Earth, your velocity is which direction? It is always tangential. So if your particle is here, it is always tangential. The, fortunately, the angle at this time is 90 degrees. From your R. So which one rotate, you know, the runs faster, flies faster? Because here R is distance, and then M is mass constant. The velocity here is here. Consider compare this one to your R naught, the distance, and then mass is constant, and then this is R and V naught. That means in this case, if you are using conservation of angular momentum, because sine 90, sine 90, 1, 1. So, you know, they cancel out. So, the farther the particle located, the, you know, slower velocity it is going to get. Making sense? So, you are, if you are, you know, you know satellite is rotating along an orbit, the closer here, the bigger velocity you are going to get. Because you know, you know, to not to attract it to your, your uh, the, the center of your rotation, it has to fly with a higher velocity. 
if that is located further away location, the actual velocity is going to be smaller because R times V is going to be constant. So if you have a bigger R, you will have smaller V. Smaller R, bigger V. This is another good and uh, popular uh, example you may uh, you know, need to solve, especially using conservation of angular momentum. So far so good? All right, let's see what else I missed. And then we can move to uh, work and energy. So let's see. What is work and energy? Kinetic energy? What is kinetic energy? Half of m velocity squared, is that right? What is a potential energy? There are two different potential energies. One is about potential energy related to spring. This is one half k deformation squared, right? And then another potential energy is associated with gravity. So this is going to be weight times vertical displacement or elevation. If you have kinetic energy and potential energy, you can you can do work because you store energy either putting this one in at the higher location or your spring is compressed or if you are flying with your velocity these all can do work so now these are uh, two popular kinetic energy and popular you know the potential energies especially if you are interested in how much you know uh, the force and uh, actual you know kinetic energy is there this is a good example if you are deform a spring and then what happens the force will be generated and then how does that work linear relationship right making sense so if you are deform a spring by this much and then you will have how much force you are making spring constant times x1 because this is a total you know, deformation of your spring. If you are moving a little bit further, maybe you know, compress your spring more, and then you reach to x2, what is the actual force the you know, spring is exerting? That is going to be spring constant times the total displacement, okay? So now the actual slope of your spring is called k, the spring constant. Now, how, how can we calculate the total you know, energy stored or done by a spring? The textbook has you know, different approaches, but you know, follow my you know, option, this is probably easier. The total work done by a spring, I use absolute you know, sign, and then simply half of k x2 squared minus half of k x1 squared. That means initial deformation, final, you know, initial deformation, and this is final deformation. And then put into, you know, absolute. That means it doesn't matter. It is a compression spring, extension spring, don't care, all right? So you need to find out the total magnitude. And then you have to decide either this is a positive work or negative work. Determining positive and negative work is important. How do you determine that? For springs, think about it. Here is an extension spring. Here is a compression spring. Extension spring means initially that was like this, but it can be extended, right? Compression spring means initially like this, it can be compressed. So far so good, two different types of springs. If that is extended like this for the extension spring, which direction the spring exert the force? It is, this is going to be the force direction, right? If you are extending the extension spring, which direction this one, you know, this one try to pull, you know, this one back. If you are making the compression spring compressed, what, what does this do? It will push this one back. So this is the direction of your force. So, how do we determine the sign of a total work done by a spring? If the motion is in the same direction as your force, 
from the spring, it is positive. It doesn't matter. In this case, con you know, compression spring, the motion this way is going to be positive work. If the motion is in the opposite direction, like this, like this, then it's going to be negative work. So simply choose a sign front of your absolute based upon that principle. Because your textbook only cover extension spring only one case, but this one can cover all different scenarios made by diff two different types of springs, whether this one is extending or compressing. Okay, so I strongly recommend you to remember the formula, the how to determine the magnitude and then assign these signs. All right, and then the work and energy method. So here I'm writing this one again. So T1 plus U1 to 2 is going to be T2. And then impulse and momentum, and V plus impulse is going to be same as M2, M1, and V1 and V2. So remember these two equations, we'll use them in the examples later. If only, um, you know, I'm going to make it simpler. If no friction involved, you can apply the conservation of energy. So like T1 plus V1 equals T2 plus V2 means if you have two discrete points, saying that here is point one and point two, if you have initial kinetic energy and potential energy, that will be conserved if there is no friction involved. So this is another important uh, formula you can use, yes. I want to ask for impulse, is there a difference between impulse and impact, or are they considered uh -huh. the same? Okay, this is a big question, so let me check your chat. Okay, I think a question from Lawrence is explained, explained by Elijah. Yes, so he, he explained exactly. So now, here's a question. What is impulse? This is simply integration of force over time. That's it. This is the definition of impulse. If you are given, you know, for example, constant time and constant force, and it is applied to your body over a specific time period. Then this is impulse. Have to integrate then. Right. That if that apply. force is not constant, no, you need to integrate it. You know, over the time period. Okay, thank you. And then, what is impulsive motion? What is impulsive motion or impulsive force? Impulsive force means. You know, the force, the magnitude is big enough, and then apply time duration is very short. This is the definition of impulsive force and impulsive motion. But impulse can be calculated either that is impulsive motion or not. Because this definition is here, so it doesn't say that your know, force should be big and time duration is small. No. It just says there's a force over Impulse time. Okay. can be calculated for, for your pulley system. If we are pulling this one slowly up, still we can apply. We know how much force is applied, how much time it took, maybe 10 seconds. It can be done. But impulsive motion like hitting a ball with a bat, hitting a soccer ball with a foot, because the time duration between your bat and ball is very small, and the amount of force applied to your particle is going to be significant. All right? Then it is called uh, impulsive motion. What else? I think um, we're done. Okay, anything else I missed? Now we can move to rigid body. Same equations can be applied to rigid body because rigid body start rotating. So if you are considering rotational motion, and then your angular acceleration is constant, same as A is constant here, V 
we can apply exact same you know principle to find what is your axial velocity here omega here's a v is going to be omega naught plus alpha key and then what is the rotational position same as s in the linear translational motion that is going to be theta naught plus omega naught t plus half of alpha t squared okay and then exactly same rule applied to here omega square minus omega naught square is going to be 2 alpha uh, theta minus theta naught so if alpha is constant we can use these formulas for your rotational motion You remember instant center of velocity? What is that? Where do we use this? This one can be used for many different applications, but specifically, if you are interested in finding the motion of your rigid body, which is subject to general plane motion, what type of motions are there? Pure rotation? And also pure translation. And also the other one is called general plane motion. Can you distinguish pure rotation from pure translation and general plane motion? What is the pure rotation? Like this, your rigid body is rotating about a fixed point. This is a rotation about O in this case. This is a pure rotation. If your body, you know, rigid body moves from here to here, it doesn't matter the path, whether this one is moving this way or moving this way, we don't care. We only care about a couple things. Number one, if that is pure, pure translation, every point in your body will be subject to same velocity or motion. So like point here, move to here, to here. Point here, move to here, to here. These two vectors are exactly the same. Right? That is called you know, pure translational motion. But what is general plane motion? If you have both pure rotation and pure translation, it is called general plane motion. Your rigid body experiences both translational motion and then rotational motion. Here is an example. If you have a wheel rotating, you know, it is you know rolling without you know, slipping, and then here is the center, and then here is I'm going to call A, the center. If that rotates with angular velocity, what happens after some time later? They will move to probably here, right? And then this is a still center point. Where is A? Assume A is here. What kind of motion is this? Is that pure rotation or translation? Is general plane motion because look at this a move to a prime right and then o move to o prime they are not subject to same exact you know translation or velocity so in this case what is the velocity of a in this direction right making sense what is the velocity of a this direction so the, chain, the, the points, you know, velocity chain from A to A prime. So they are not, you know, so experiencing translational motion anymore. So what happened here is, it is called general plane motion. How do we, um, you know, analyze this kind of problem? Assume that this one moved to here to here, right? So translational motion. And then assume that this was rotated about O. So it is not real thing happening in the real world, but in order to understand or analyze a problem for the general plane motions, we split that into translation motion and rotational motion. So let's say here it translated from here to here, then stopped and then rotated here to here. Then it is going to give you exact you know general plane motion. Okay. So now it is written as I think there is a formula I can write for you. I want to follow you back yet. So now. Um, what is a good, um, I think I, I need to 
check the, the, the full sheet, what they, they wrote. Um, I'll, I'll show that later. Um, anything else? Oh, impact. Do you remember E? E value? What is E? It's, I think, a lasting coefficient. I yeah, it's a coefficient of called restitution. And then what is this? If there is a colliding, you know, happening between two particles, we can find this. The differences of velocities after, and this is. Oops. Before. So, for example, if you are, you have two particles flying with initial velocity, like this after they are met and they're going through deformation and restitution they will fly back with your final velocity like this then you can find the relationship between the differences of velocities and this is called coefficient of restitution so this one is functional materials let's say you know mod plus uh, mod to mod or elastic to elastic so in this case, I have, oh, I don't have yeah, two moles. If they are met in the middle here, they will experience some deformation. This is period of deformation, and then they will experience some restitution, right? So in this case, depending on the material, if assume these are two metal balls, met and then away, and then versus these two, you know, the rubber balls. Depending on the material, you will have totally different the E value. So if E equals one, what does that mean? The ratio before and after is exactly the same. If they are exactly elastic, your pure elastic balls, before, after they will exactly have the exact same, you know, the velocities after and even before the impact. If they are met and they fly with the same one single body, what does it mean? It means they you know, fly together, it is called pure plastic. And then most of E values are between zero and one. So it's a pure elastic, pure, el uh, pure elastic, pure plastic, general case. Good? Yes? I did want to ask the difference between elastic and plastic in terms of elastic means they bounce off does plastic mean they just hit and stick together and don't? Okay, so elastic, pure elastic means after you know deformation, all deformations are fully re restored. There's no energy loss, right? Yes. yes. And then plastic means when after they you know they are deformed, no restitution, no restoration happens. They just stick together. Yeah, stick okay. together, fly together. Okay, thank you. Anything else I missed? Any questions so far? I know it is too fast, but you know, this is a summary of <laughs> 10 week long class. I have to go fast. Anything else? Yes. Um, I was just curious on like what the relationship was between impulse and work. Like how are they related? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, we have some examples. So hopefully you, okay. you, you, you get the answer from solving those examples. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Next one is, if you are handling rotational rigid body motion, you will see J a lot. What is J? Yes, I will pull up the formulas right here. If you miss many of this, I put these formulas, you know, on canvas, so you are able to see all of these I covered here. Yeah. So don't worry about it. So here's the energy then the impulse conservation of energy and then the you know coefficient of restitution and then this is about general plane motion oh I you know will cover you know instantental velocity here's an example um, we'll cover instantental velocity first ah, it is so this is called formal link. 
take a look at this. The link here, one is called ground, ground the link. And then here is a rotation with some angle of velocity. And then here is another pure rotation with angle of velocity. And then there is called you know, coupler connecting these two pure rotating links. This is called link number three. So how many links are there? Link one, link two, link three, and link four. That's why it is called forward link. Good? Now, as I told you before, link two and link four are subject to pure rotation. It is easy to understand, you know, their, you know, the motions like this. are interested in, I think I can just guide, you know, you know, uh, what is the best way? Can we hit back? Undo? Yeah. No, it's individually. Let me write something on here. Yes. I'll get out and then back. Can I erase this part? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For example, here's a rotating arm, and then there is a ground, and then this is rotating. I'm going to call this one link number two. And then it is rotating with, you know, angle of velocity, omega 2. And they're assuming this is the angle, theta 2. Now I'm interested, what is the velocity at point A? What is the velocity A? How do you find it? So this is rotational motion. Think about this point. It's similar to a particle subject to a rotational motion. Which direction does this particle have a velocity? It is always tangent to the circle, right? So where is the circle? There is a circle, right? Oops, it's not good. There is a circle. So now, which direction? The point A has its own velocity? Tangent to. So if you are able to draw a point, from the center of your rotation to the point of your interest. I'm gonna call this one L2, okay? And then your velocity is always 90 degrees from your position vector. And then if there is rotating counterclockwise, it is up direction. It is clockwise, it is down direction. So when you are interested in finding a linear velocity of point in a bridge device like this, subject to pure rotation, this is always 90 degree from the position vector. Good? So now this is it. So you found BA. Good? So far so good? Now, if you remember here, there is another link connected to the ground. And then I'm going to call this one link number four. Okay, and then if this is rotating with angular velocity omega four. Now, what is the velocity of point B? Again, you, if you're not sure, draw a vector from point of rotation center to the point of interest. This is called angular L4. And then, what is the direction of velocity? This way. Making sense? This is intuitively correct because here is a V4, 90 degree from the position vector because it is rotating counterclockwise, so it is downward. If it's clockwise, upward. So far so good? Now, understanding the you know, motion of pure rotation of link two and link four is easy. But what about the link connecting between these two? I'm gonna call this one link number three. This one is experiencing general plane motion. Means it is not simply a translation, it is not rotation. Both rotation and translations are 
in the motion of link number three. Good? So now, how do we understand? What, what is the, you know, angular velocity of link number three? What is the velocity of point, you know, ar I mean, arbitrary point in number three? We don't know. So this is how we can find the, those, you know, unknown information, especially talking about general plane motion. So now, how do we find it? This is where using called instant center of velocity is applied. How do you find instant center of velocity? It's easy. Drawing, because take a look at these velocity, point A and B, from the link three point of view. Okay? VA is also part of link three. VB and four is also part of link three as well, right? So now, instant center of velocity means this body is instantaneously rotating about this point. Assuming, you know, this is a subject to, you know, pure rotation about this point. So how do you find that point? If you know two velocities, draw perpendicular line from the known velocity and also from the second velocity, and then there is an intersection. This is called instant center of velocity for this body. So good. So now we know that this body is rotated about this center. That's how we got this velocity and this velocity. So can you find out this distance? Yes, you can graphically find this distance. Can you find this? Yes. And then can you find out angular velocity of this body? Assuming this is rotating this. How? You know, do you, do you remember this? Velocity is angular velocity times the length is going to be linear velocity. So now we know this body is one point velocity, and then we can calculate you know, distance between here from geometry, then you are able to find out angular velocity of this one. This is the idea. Same thing. You know, here, omega 3, uh, so velocity A is going to be omega, which is omega 3, times R between A, I call it C, A to C. Same idea. V, I'm going to just call B, B, because this is point B. So B is going to be same angular velocity, omega 3 times R B to 3. So you, you can find the geometry, you know, from the geometry find these, you know, lengths and then apply this relation because this is found, this is found. What is A, V, A? What is the magnitude of this one? Omega 2 times length, R2. Because we know this and this. Good? So you can plug this one into here and you are able to find out this. Same idea. How do you find VB, this is omega 4 times the length, L4. So this is a given geometry. If you know the angular velocity, you have to find this, plug this one here, they should be same. This is how we got here. So now starting from VA, you know, omega 3, so follow this. Any questions about this instant center of velocity? There are multiple, you know, in, instant center of velocity, the uh, you know, formulas and applications, but this is probably the most complex problem you may encounter in your exam. That's why I introduced this, you know, forward link problem here for you. Couple instant center of velocities. If you have a rotating, you know, circle like this, pure rotation. The point where the actual wheel is meeting with the surface, it is in the center. This is IC. That means if you are interested in finding the velocity of arbitrary point in your rigid body, draw a line perpendicular. This is a you know, linear velocity of point A. If you are interested in finding the velocity of this point, draw a line from the instant center and then just you know 90 degree, this is it. Everybody okay with this concept? 
So instant center velocity IC is a very useful way to find velocities if you are handling rigid body rotational motion, especially if it is subject to general plane motion. You know, this is another, you know, here, instant center for, you know, you know, uh, the slider inside of your con concave shape. If you look at here, the velocity here, velocity here, if you are making, you know, this, you know, um, uh, 90 degree uh, perpendicular line, they are met at one point. This is, you know, center of this curvature. Same idea, convex, the center of, you know, the convex surface is going to be IC. So assuming that at this instance, your rigid body is rotating about that instant center velocity, IC point. This is very useful to find many velocities in your rigid body. Okay, good. What else I missed? Oh, there is a very important topic I missed. Moment of inertia. What is moment of inertia? You know this, right? What is what does M do? Resistance. If you apply force to a body, compare small mass versus a big mass. Same force, small mass will experience big acceleration, right? Because of this formula. Making sense? So the bigger M, the harder to make it accelerated. Good? So with a given force. For the rotating component, there is a counterpart. Number of torque is going to be J times alpha. Torque is also a vector, alpha is a vector. So what does this mean? They are exactly equivalent. The torque applied to your body, and then the, the body will experience rotational acceleration. How? According to the moment of inertia, the bigger moment of inertia, the harder to rotate. Everyone okay with this concept? So you have a huge disc versus a small disc. If you are rotating this huge disc and the small disc, apply the torque from a motor. If that is huge, it is hard to make it accelerate, making you know big alpha versus small or maybe light wheel. Making sense? So if you are designing a motor connected to a huge wheel, you know, the huge wheel means it has huge moment of inertia. That means it's hard to rotate. So this is called you know, resistance for rot rotation. So exactly same, you know, if you know identical equation in rigid body, this is a translational you know, motion, it's a rotational motion. So now we need to find out for J. In this case, they say I, J, but I, but depends on textbook. Some books use J, some books use I. The definition is integration of R squared dm. This is the definition of moment of inertia. If you look at your dynamics book, you will be able to find out some you know, formulas like this. Do you remember this? This kind of you know formulas for mass moment of inertia? Depending on geometry. Yeah, depending on the geometry. For example, here is a rod like this. So now, if you are rotating rod, the, the formula here is called 1 twelfth of ml squared. So L is the total length, and then M is your mass. So here, if you are rotating this one around the center point, like G, this is it. This one is quantified by how hard that is to be rotated based upon that I or J value. You have to remember, this is a very popular formula for rotating rod like this. But what about this? This versus this. Which one is harder? This versus this. This is exactly the same geometry, but based upon the rotational point, either center, or one end point. Which one is harder? This is harder. So, in this case, do you remember parallel axis theorem? 
this formula is assumed that your rotation is about the center point. But if your point of your rotation is moved from here to here, for example, your J value, moment inertia, will be changed. How? Using this. This is your formula. But if your center of new rotation is this far, then you have to plus m times b, the distance squared. Then this is going to be new you know, momentary inertia. So in this case, this is very popular for the rod. This is going to be one third of ml squared. This is a very popular momentary inertia you better remember. Again, rotating about the center is a one twelfth ml squared. Rotating about one end point is one third of ml squared. This is called moment of inertia of a rod. For rectangle, here rectangle. So the number one, rotation about x is rotation about x. Here, assuming this is x, this is x. Rotate about this. What about this? Rotation about y. This is y. Rotation about y. Okay? And then here, rotation about z, z is here, rotation about z. Exactly same object, same rigid body, but you know, based upon the rotational axis, it will have different moment of inertia. This versus, this versus, this, these all have totally different moment of inertia formulas. So this is another very important you know, formula so you better remember. These are you know, common sense for engineers, okay? Yes. I did want to ask uh, regarding these geometries, are these located in the dynamics reference or in the statics reference? Dynamics. Dynamics. Yeah, okay. moment of inertia is always about dynamics. Okay. And then the third one, this is also very popular, you know, a, a cylinder. And if a cylinder is, you know, here, here's a cylinder. You know, rotating about x, it's going to be like this, rotate about x. But here is an X and Y and Z means rotating about this or rotating about this. Okay, right? So this is another you know, important um, the formula you have to remember. So now if that is rotating about the center point, it is half of ML squared. But if it rotates about this or this, it's going to be one quarter of ML squared. So I strongly recommend remember all these formulas. These are very important. Okay. Where are we using this? Many places. So if you are using, for example, Newton's second law for linear, again, angular, torque is going to be moment inertia times alpha. So if you don't know moment inertia, you cannot solve Newton's second law problem. Same idea, linear momentum is L is MV, but angular momentum H is called I alpha. You remember there was L cross N V. If you just you know you move you know have a little more derivation, you are able to have this. So angular momentum is you know here angular moment of inertia times angular velocity. Okay, and then take a look at this linear kinetic energy was half of N V squared, right? And the kinetic energy rotation is half of I omega squared. Exactly same format, but we replace M with I or J, V with omega, that's it. Same thing, you know, here if you are looking at the work and energy, same idea. So this is a work, but this is you know force time displacement, this is torque time rotational displacement. Good? In, in here, in this case, M is replaced by I if there is an angle. So I, I, I put all the you know necessary places you are going to use moment of inertia. So understand moment of inertia is important. And then another thing you, you can remember is called the radius of gyration. So assuming your mass is concentrated on only one single point, rather than having your, your body rotating about axis. You know, here's the axis, you know, what is rotate, you know, your whole total mass is concentrated at one point. What is the, you know, distance? This is called Rm. How can we find it? This is a formula. Square root of your moment of inertia divided by M. Okay, this is called radius of gyration. And then you know the, the formula where we are using I or J in Newton's second law problem. 
So work on energy method, if you are handling rigid body, not only you have to use your center point, the velocity, for, to calculate the kinetic energy, you have to add the second point because it is rotating. So it is moving, but it is rotating. So you have to add translational component for the kinetic energy, but centroidal you know, rotational component in your kinetic energy as well. So you, you added this part for the rigid body. So this is an example. So this one started from the horizontal position and they moved down to this position. Initially, kinetic energy was zero, potential energy was zero, assuming this is a data. Now, I'm interested in how fast the actual, the, you know, the rigid body rotating, the, the omega here, how do you find it? Using conservation of energy. So T1 plus V1 equals to T2 plus V2. We know that this is zero, this is zero from here. Okay, and then you need to calculate how much is the kinetic energy. At this point, we will have two components. This is, you know, translational component. This is a rotational component. Take a look at this. This is your J, moment of inertia. See? So, what is the moment of inertia of a rod? Rotation about the center, one twelfth of ml squared, right? And then you, you can have this expression, and then you can find out tangential energy. Uh, you know, um, you know, um, not tangential, uh, <coughs> rotational energy for this particle, either uh, this rigid body, because this one down this much, this is simply about weight times the you know vertical displacement, and then you are putting these all together into this you know angular uh, conservation of energy. You are able to find out your omega value. So this is a good example how we can apply conservation of energy using translation component and rotation component. Particles, we only consider the first part, right? Here. But the rotational component needed to be considered in a rigid body motion. Um, you can read about friction, because there are two different frictions, static friction, kinetic friction. If your force is smaller than kinetic friction times the normal force, no slipping. If that is same, is about to move, if it starts moving, you will have a new friction called kinetic friction. I, I think that's the end of uh, dynamics. Vibration still here. <laughs> any any questions so far? Yeah. Yeah, I did want to ask. I mean, I, I know we're going to talk about vibrations later. Uh, is there a particular process you'd recommend for solving those problems, like state space models, or is there is state space model? Uh, dynamics. You don't need to go state space model. Okay. This is about you know you don't need to go that far. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So they're simplified then. Yeah. So okay. use all the formulas we we studied together. Okay. That's enough. You know, Okay. For dynamics and then um, vibration problems. Okay, thank you. I just noticed the. I just noticed that. No, this is thing. about vibration problems. Okay. It's a different story. Yes. Okay, thank you. And any questions so far? Do you need some, some break or? Okay, five minutes. Yes. So we'll come back uh, ten fifty-five. We'll we'll continue from there. All right, so um, you remember um, this figure, we use mass spring damper a lot in my 3.43, so if this is a given external force given to your body, you are able to line up your mass times, acceleration of your, you know, the body, you know, damping, velocity plus you know, spring constant k. This is a standard format of your, uh, you know, the, the equation. So if you have no force applied to your body, so simply you have initial displacement and then interest in finding the position, velocity, and acceleration of your body. This is called, you know, natural means you know not forced. So if you have no force here, you know everything goes this part. If 
if there is anything left on the right side of the equation except these three terms, it is called force. Means there is any, you know, external force applied to your body. Okay, and, and then, um, you know, under natural and then forced response of your system, there are two different, you know, types of, you know, undamped and then damped. Undamped and damped. Undamped means, uh, you know, there is no, you know, um, the, the C means like there's no damper associated, but this is, there is a damper, no damper and damper. This is how we can categorize, you know, vibration motions. And then if you have, this part, it is called homogeneous motion and a homogeneous solution. This part is called a particular solution. Do you remember from your math classes, homogeneous solution versus the four, you know, particular solution from your um, um, differential equation courses? And then if there's no damping, you know, you will be able to have this equation because there is no C and then there are a couple of things you have to remember. In this case, this reminds you something. Omega n, undamped natural frequency, which is k over m square root. So this is going to be x double dot plus omega n squared x equals zero. This is a popular um, the equation for undamped free vibration. Free vibration means there's no external force applied, that's why the right side of the equation is zero, and then left side there is no C shown, okay? So this is called, you know, pure oscillator. So it will oscillate back and forth with a constant magnitude forever, because there is no damping effect applied here, good? So this is called pure oscillator. And then, um, here's a very interesting topic, you better read this part about vertical mass spring versus you know horizontal mass spring, whether we have to consider you know uh, gravitational force in this you know in this uh, the, uh, you know analysis or not. This is explained here. Okay, I'm going to leave this one up to you. And then we know that this is an undamped natural frequency. What is a damped natural frequency? That was omega n times square root of one minus zeta squared. Zeta squared. Okay. For the undamped natural frequency, this is a typical, you know, response. So either they can be either this form or this form, um, you know. And then what does that make is, take a look at this. In this case, you know, the magnitude of your you know, response is going to be here because sine, cosine, sine function magnitude is one maximum. So that will be amplified by A. And then this is an undamped natural frequency. And then phi here is going to be the shift of your response in, in your time domain. And then you already know that what this guy is, is called period. This is you know, inverse of you know, the frequency. And then there is another thing you have to remember. This is you know, uh, the, the frequency, but you shouldn't forget about two pi. What is hertz? One cycle per second, right? And then how much is one cycle? This is a two pi. And then regular you know, frequency is in radian. So that's why we got this formula. So this is another thing you have to remember. You know, this is a period, this is a frequency, and then this is a natural frequency. This is in hertz, this is in radian. So far so good? Everybody okay with this? Then torsional, you know, rotational, exactly same. That was the previous x double dot plus here's x, and then it was k over m, but replacing simply rotational spring constant, this is the moment to be measured, right? So exactly same format for the uh, undamped, um, you know, uh, the natural frequency, a uh, natural response. I don't think you need to worry too much about a particular solution. I think that's all. So we are given 30 minutes. I will go over and select some you know, um, examples. I will solve them together so that you can have better understanding from now on. So in your, 
in your canvas, you are given, you know, six, and one, two, three, yeah, six example sets, like one, two, three, and four, five, and six. I don't think I can solve them together here. I will select only, you know, you know, a few of them. But you are given some time until next Monday, you know, solve these rest of them. These are, um, you know, upload the file. You can solve them on paper. Also, there is a quiz set you can solve from directly from Canva. There are two different types of examples. So if you have time, feel free to finish those examples. Starting from here, example one is mostly about kinetics, or kinematics of particles. Um, let's start example number one first. So here is a curvilinear motion. Oh, is it curvilinear motion? Maybe a typo. Okay, so if you are given a position like this with a function of time, how do you find you know velocity and acceleration? Simply differentiating this one with respect to time one and two, you have to find out acceleration. In this case, you know v is going to be twenty plus eight p minus what is that? 9p squared. So if this is given, how do you find out what is this? V is ds over dt. Okay. So how do you find initial velocity? What does the initial velocity mean? T equals zero. So simply plug in zero into here so V can be found. Okay? So this is a very simple example. I don't think you have any issues with this. Uh, what about Okay, we'll talk about projectile. So if this one I, I, I should, okay, so now I will give you an answer for this. So, so 20 is the answer. We talk about projectile. So now this one has initial velocity 110, and then launch angle is 20 degrees. Then air friction or drag is you know neglected. How much is a you know flight time? How do you find it? How do you find the flight time? Is it going to use horizontal component or vertical component? Vertical. Yeah, vertical so component. Vertical when it's half this is, it. Yes, yeah. uniformly accelerated motion, right? That means a is minus g. So now, if you remember, you know, what is the velocity function in the vertical direction from the formula, how do you, you know, determine when this one reaches the highest point, and then velocity is going to be zero. And then you can find the time from here, and then multiply this one by two, because it will go up and then down. So your know, flight time is going to be two times over t. So if you do this, that is going to be, 7.7 seconds. Again, I'm going to leave this totally up to you. I'm going to show how you know, big you know, general approach of these problems, not detailed calculations. Good. And then, anything else? Okay, this is also an interesting uh, kinematics problem. This is roller coaster, so it is a you know, curvilinear motion. And then it is constant gradient. And then there's a 10 seconds is given, acceleration is a constant. What does the acceleration is constant mean? Do you remember? In this case, because there's no theta and then r is given, I'd rather use tangent and then normal coordinate system. So in this case, do you remember acceleration? That was tangential component plus normal component, tangential component is dv dt, and then normal component is v squared over the radius of curvature, right? So now what does this constant acceleration mean? That means dv dt is zero, uh, this is 0 0.4. Making sense? Everyone okay? So here, if you see a constant acceleration, is this. Because, take a look at this. If you are assuming here the example, if we are rotating this one with a constant speed, 
let's say here's a stone and then you are rotating this one with a you know a string and then this is a constant it's not accelerating it is a constant speed so what is the acceleration at the time this part is going to be zero is that right because db dt is not accelerating in the tangential direction but still you shouldn't forget about considering the normal component because there is a velocity and there's a geometry. So normal component is not zero. Making sense? So in your problem, if acceleration is constant, means only tangential component is constant. And then now average velocity, you know, then you can just find out setting this one equals you know 0 0.4. And then average velocity. What is average velocity? What does it mean? What is the velocity? Velocity is going to be initial velocity plus your acceleration times time. So if I calculate that, I think we should be able to have this number. Uh, oh, I forgot to include the answer for this. I, but the one thing you have to remember is in this case the important part is you know acceleration is constant is only for the tangential component that's important but i don't have the answer here i don't know <laughs> okay so i'm going to move to i think I, I don't need to do this let's go to example number two There is a block, you know, sliding down the slope, and then slope with geometry is given like this, and then friction coefficient is given, and then what is asked to find? Oh, here you are. So when this one reaches, you know, point B, what is the velocity? What kind of problem is it? Is it kinetics or kinematics? Kinetics. Okay, so kinetics. Why is kinetics? You see mass of the particle, and then gravitational force will be applied here, and then this is going to be considered as a particle because we do not know about the dimension of this guy, so we can assume that this one is not you know rotating, and then how can you find your 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 actual the velocity when this one reaches to the position B. So kinetics, particle, what to use? Either you can use Newton's second law, right? In which direction? If you are given a problem like this, I strongly recommend set your equation along the slope, like this. Not general X and Y. This is easier for you if you're setting x along the, the slope is easier so now if you are summing forces in x direction and then finding the acceleration from the uh, this equation so now you should be able to find all the forces applied to your body right there is you know normal force there is a weight and there is a frictional force and then find all the component in the x direction and setting this one equals you know max then you can find out AX, the acceleration. Good, if you are given acceleration and then you know there is a displacement and then interest in finding the velocity. So, which one you can use? Velocity squared minus initial velocity is going to be two times A in the X direction and then delta S, is that right? So delta S is given here, 20 meters, and then this is zero. And then this is thing you wanna find this is from here. So this is a good example using both Newton's second law equation to find out the acceleration and then apply this one to kinematics equation. The answer here is 9.8. It's okay. I think this is one very typical problem using Newton's second law and kinematics equation. Problem. Uh, I 
go ahead and explain this one this way. For the translation of motion, either going up or down or left and right. This is important. So, okay. How do you determine positive and then negative velocity? What does that positive velocity mean? Your particle is moving, for example, assuming this is positive x. If you're moving into the positive x direction, it is called positive velocity, right? If I'm moving backward, it means I'm moving in the negative direction of your positive coordinate, it is called negative velocity, is that right? But what about acceleration? If I'm moving forward, is that positive acceleration or negative acceleration? It is the one thing students really, really get confused. If I move it to the front, you know, forward, acceleration can be either positive or negative. How? Slowing down, probably. Yeah, it depends on how it's slowing down. Or yes. Faster. If I'm accelerating, maybe, you know, I'm driving a car, I'm, I'm accelerating, you know, making, you know, speeding up, and moving forward, is it positive acceleration, right? But if I'm, you know, braking, Still, I'm moving forward, it is negative acceleration. So, you know, don't be confused. You know, direction of your motion is not determining, you know, completely your acceleration. It can have either positive or negative when I'm moving forward. But what about when I'm moving backward? What happens? I'm backing my car, I'm backing my car. Can I have positive acceleration? Yes. Yes, how? Because you're going back. Slow down. If I slow down when I'm backing, it is positive acceleration. But if I'm speeding up while backing, it is negative acceleration. So your acceleration is more complex than you know. This is you know direction of motion determines the positive and negative velocity. But you know this one has actually two component here. For example, moving moving in the positive direction, negative direction. If you are moving in the positive direction and then speeding up, this is positive acceleration. If you are slowing down, this is negative acceleration. If you are moving backward, you know, direction of motion is you know, backward. If you are speeding up, this is negative acceleration. If you are slowing down, this is positive acceleration. This is thing you know you have to remember. This is really important. Now, if you are applying this one for an elevator problem like this, I'm not going to solve this one here. But think about it. Your elevator is moving up. I assume this is positive direction. This is negative direction. Assuming this is positive coordinate. All right. So. Same thing, if elevator moves up, it can have both positive and negative acceleration. It is moving down, it can have also positive and negative acceleration. So when you are calculating, you know, and then what happens if you moving up with positive acceleration, accelerating, what, what, what do you feel? Do you feel heavier or lighter? Your elevator is moving up with acceleration. You feel heavier. If you're moving down with the acceleration, you feel lighter. That means even though you are, you know, your you know, elevator is 100, 100, you know, um, 1800 kilogram, and then you are here is like a 67 kilogram, depending on the elevator's acceleration at the time, you can be either way higher or lower. So far so good? So if you are talking about, you know, your acceleration of your um, the elevator. What does it say? So you have to consider, you know, acceleration of your elevator, and then you have to add if that is positive to your your you know body you know weight. If that is negative, you have to subtract this one from your body weight. So so good. So if your even though your elevator is moving up, but it is slowing down. It is not giving you positive you know, acceleration, means you feel lighter. You only feel heavier if elevator goes up with positive.
crash through acceleration, speeding up. But if that is slowing down, let's say you are close to the end of your Empire State Building, it will go slow down. Then you feel lighter because at that time the acceleration is negative. You have to subtract that much acceleration from your weight. Making sense? So if you are moving down, not always you feel lighter. No. If you are speeding up in the you know down direction, it's negative acceleration. That means you, you feel lighter. But if that is slow down, almost close to the end of your you know destination, you will still also you know feel heavier because it's a positive acceleration. So you know if you are given an elevator problem, it is a very popular problem you will see in your FE exam. You always think about these four scenarios. This is important. I'm not gonna solve this one here. But answer is, I think I have the answer. Uh, B, but think about it. So why this one happened? With the you know, you know, concept of positive and negative acceleration. Moving to example three. Take a look at this problem. This is, has a mass, and then there is a gravitational force, and then displacement is a given. So here is a guide from here, and the ball has its own mass, right? And then here is a spring constant. This is a you know, box, and then you know um, it is compressed, compressed. Because you know, if that is compressed, spring can store energy, and then that will push this one up, and then this one reaches point A. So there are two discrete points here. I'm gonna say you know, origin <coughs> and then A. Two points are given, and then mass is there, and the spring is involved, and then displacement is here. So what is the best way to solve this? What can be a best problem? You know, you know, approach we can solve multiple ways. Initial velocity given. This is a velocity you want to find, right? Uh, it's not. So this is, you know, this is zero, right? And then only need to find out how much work done between points here one and two. What kind of work you can find here? It's done by gravity, and then done by spring. spring. And then there is no friction, so friction is zero. So if you are finding these two, how do you find this? What is the work done by gravity? Mg. Yeah, mgh or wy, delta y, right? And then spring. B1 and then k. And then do you remember that spring? You know the work done by spring. Absolute sign f of k final deflection minus half of k initial deflection and then you know put plus and minus sign depending on the direction of your motion and then direction of your force made by the force and made by the spring so this is going to be your spring work so if you are adding them together so because this is you know your initial spring compression you are interested to find this making sense so now in this case, this answer is C. You can go and check, or you can use this one from conservation of energy. Because there is no friction involved, you can find P1 and V1 equals P2 and V2. So both of them will work. Work and energy, using this, or conservation of energy, both will work to find the answer. But if you're using Newton's second law, it is hard. Because Newton cycle, you have to find out acceleration first, apply this one to kinematics, it will take longer and then it will be harder. So in this case, you know that these two discrete points are given, we know these velocities, it is fine, easy to find the deflection directly out of this work and energy equation. Uh, what is this? Yes. This is a problem with um, collision, right? So two balls, head on, 
means like exactly you know moving like this at all. Initially, the velocity of each ball at the time of the collision is two meters. So now assuming this is a positive in x direction, here two meter per sec. This one is minus two meter per sec. Is that right? And then coefficient of restitution is 0 0.5. Do you remember what is this? This is I'm gonna call it ball one and ball two. So B2 after collision minus B1 after collision is same, you know, over B1 initial minus B2 initial. So make sure that, you know, because in the X direction is positive direction here, you have to make sure this is positive, this is negative. Good? So if you plug this one in here, then you will be able to kind of find out this, but this is not enough because, you know, but it, it, it is enough. Take a look at this. This is 0 0.5. But there are two unknowns. How can we solve this? There are two unknowns, one equation. Is that same mass? Yeah. Oh, same mass, yes. So, uh, number one, you can intuitively find the same mass, same velocity. What if they are different mass, okay. different masses? Linear momentum. Linear momentum conserved. If you have a collision problem, do you remember this guy? Impulse. Okay. So if there are two, you know, the particles involved, and then if you consider these two as a one single system, what about this guy? For this guy experienced from here, and then for this guy is from here, they are exactly the same magnitude opposite direction. So if you are summing initial momentum, summing all the impulses, and then summing the final momentum, this goes zero. So if you are handling a collision problem like this, if you are not interested in internal forces, Consider as you know one two particles as one single system. In turn, because there is no you know you know the gravitational forces are all neglected because these are non you know um, you know impulsive you know forces. So now only the force considered in this equation is internal forces here and here. But if you consider these two as one single system, they all cancel out. That is called conservation of conservation of momentum. Take a look at this, before and after. What is before? Before is mv1 plus mv2 equals mv1 prime plus mv2 prime. So every single collision problem can use conservation of momentum like this. Because m are all the same, and then this is the second equation, this is the first equation. Then you are able to find out B1 prime and then B2 prime out of this. So if you do this, the answer is this. But in three tools you can find, uh, but no, you have to use both equations. Everybody okay? So collision problem is not that simple, but you have to make sure, you know, coefficient of restitution and conservation of momentum for collision problem. If you are given rotation angle of velocity, you know that this is your velocity at point B. So now this is. How big is this? Velocity here is omega times the length. So now what is omega? 10. What is the length? 
five. So this is 50 meter per sec. Which direction? Up direction. Good. So what is asking? Angle of us now omega B C like this guy. Okay? So now can you find you know instant center velocity? So this is you know perpendicular from one velocity. This is another you know velocity perpendicular from here. So this is you know instant center velocity. Can you find the length of this one out of the geometry? So here is five, three, and four. So this is four and three. Is that right? So it's a five meter, four meter, three meters. So now you know that so here this VV is 50 here. I'm gonna just write down the V. This is instant center. This is four meters. And then what is the you know omega BC of this length? This is 50 is going to be omega BC times four. Is that right? So now the angular velocity of the the length in the middle BC is going to be 12.5, is that right? Yeah, 13 radian per second. So if you apply instant center velocity of course this problem, it can be solved very easily. So in many cases, if you are interested in finding velocities with a given length in the system, try to think about instant center velocity first. This is a concept problem. Ice skater, do you, do, you, do you know ice skater problem? If you kick with your skate on ice, and then you are not doing any further, you know, you know, given, given any further, you know, torque on your body, what happens means your, there is no more torque or moment given to you. But if the skater rotating with this initially, but coming here versus here, what happens? Torque, given to your torque is zero, right? After your initial torque. And then, what happens? Your moment of inertia was smaller, smallest. Then what happens? Because this one now, your angle acceleration goes up. That's why the skater can rotate faster. So now, what, what does it mean? If you're pulling these arms in, moment of inertia is reduced. Angular momentum is constant. Your know, total angular momentum is constant. Your angular momentum is I, I, you know, um, the alpha, right? And then, so angular momentum is I, I omega. And then this one is, you know, is conserved. And then radius of gyration is reduced because of angular moment and moment of inertia is reduced. So all of them are true. So this is one quick example. Example three is about vibrations. Um, again, I'm going to leave all the solutions for these problems on Canvas. If you are interested in solving them, um, up to you on your own. Any questions, feel free to ask me. I'm going to come back uh, for your control measurement instrumentation in two weeks. So hopefully, you're mostly from 343 uh, and also instrumentation. Uh, if you have any questions about dynamics and vibrations, come back and ask me questions. I think that's all for today. Thank you, thank you, and then good luck for your FE exam.